and it died and spent eternity in hell. Jesus said, buy the truth. Don't you sell it, sell it not. Don't sell out the truth for anything. Family heritage is not worth the truth. No, nothing. Nothing's worth my soul. I just so deeply moved oh, these gosh. lost loved ones and our children. So the Lord, I had most of them, the Lord will raise up, talk the right way, and cut their teeth on the pinnacle. They just walked away. And the Lord reminded me and said, You did too. You did. I graduated from high school, started college, and Got tied up so involved in college that I wanted to make sure that I passed. And, and I skipped church services, coming home to go to church services just so I could study. My pastor, and I thank God for pastors, he called me in one Sunday at church and said, I need to talk with you. I said, yes, sir. He said, how's school going? I said, it's really tough. I said, you know, I went through high school and didn't have to study that much. But I said, now in college, it's totally different. I said, Brother Cooper, sometimes I just don't get home and come to church. He said, if you ever want to succeed, you better change your priorities. He said, God said, his kingdom first. Right. And his righteousness. Right. And if you do that first, he said, all those other things will be taken care of. God's business first. I knew that. But I just needed him to remind me. I knew what I needed to do, but I just, nobody in our family had ever graduated, and they didn't even graduate high school. I, out of my daddy's brothers and sisters, I was the first one to graduate from high school. And he just, he stressed over and over and over and over, you just got to graduate from college. So, Dad, I, I graduated from high school. Yeah, but he said, oh, really? He had the wrong attitude. Wow. He wanted to go to family gatherings, but the team said, I want to graduate from college. Yeah. He had the wrong attitude. Yeah. I tried to tell him that, but he wasn't wanting you to tell a whole lot. He was right, and I was wrong, so I just left him alone. The Bible clearly states that all have sinned. Yeah. Come on now. And come short of the glory of God. And that we have. It's our nature. The flesh. It's human nature. It's the flesh's nature to sin. None of us are untainted. <laughs> no, sir. Because of sin, we've all been hurt. Yes, amen. Is there anybody in here that's never been hurt in life? We've all been hurt it was because of sin. This means that everyone needs repentance. And they also need recovery. That's a fact. In order to live our lives the way that God intended. That's no joke. I saw your brother, Brother Latif, the one who lives right over here. I never can remember his name, but Anthony. Anthony, I saw him Sunday and he was standing by the barber shop when he walked into Walmart to get his guy cornered. And I mean, he was he was witnessing. I just went on by and when I came back through, he was up inside the barber shop now with that same guy. They was cutting his hair. I said, "You, you still at it?" He said, "I'm playing. I'm just playing." I'm in the vineyard playing. He said, you see who this guy is? He said, you might want to water. <laughs> but I, I just had to laugh because he said, I'm working in the vineyard. I'm playing. And that's what we have to do. Amen. All hands on deck. It is not my responsibility for that seed to grow. That's God's business. Amen. God has to bring the But it's my job and your job to plant. Yes. And to irrigate the fields. 
He says that we're the seed. You see, when Israel returned from captivity in the Old Testament, their first project was to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. I'm just backtracking a little bit for the benefit of yes, the Lord. <laughs> we see here is a people who have been able to reestablish repentance. Amen. But they were unable to reestablish recovery or the laws. That's the truth. That part of the story is found in the book of Ezra. He records this rebuilding project which took 20 years and symbolized their, their restored relationship with the Lord. These people were unable to reestablish the recovery part. And as such, they are a type of those in the church today who have repented of their sins, been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They're saved, but they're still broken. And I'm going to explain. They have been fouled up by accidents and by did it by disobedience and smashed by sin, ruined by rebellion, injured through maybe just ignorance. That's the truth. They may have been forgiven for the seeds of sin that they sowed before they came to Christ, but the harvest of sowing to the flesh doesn't disappear overnight. That's a fact. When you get the Holy Ghost, that does not mean that you're not going to slip and fall. Amen. You have not arrived yet. And I find more and more people who have the Holy Ghost Come on, Pat. That live under condemnation. Uh -huh. Ain't that the truth? Over their lives. Amen. That's the truth. Salvation does solve the problem of our relationship with God. But it doesn't dissolve all the problems in our lives. Amen. I mean, if you remember the scripture, whatsoever you sow, you shall reap. I don't know about you, but I still every once in a while find seeds sprouting up in my life that, that I thought was dead and gone. Amen. And I look at that. The thought comes to my mind. And I said, why did I think that? <laughs> what in the name of the Lord? Has anybody in here ever got aggravated and frustrated and in your mind all these filthy words popped up? Amen. <laughs> Unbelievable thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh we're saved, but we're still broken. It yeah. shocks us. And the only way you can get rid of that, James says, man is drawn away of his own lust. Apostle James. Yes, sir. And then when it has conceived, it brings forth what? Yeah. Death. The vacant part of it is not sin. When you conceive on that thought and go act on that thought, then it becomes sin. Amen. Make it come alive. And so many people today live under condemnation because they saw thought something came to their mind That's and it was wicked. And, and the devil said, if you can think that, you're not saved. That's right. But that is a lie. Amen. According to James. Amen. You undoubtedly heard the expression, time heals all wounds. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that is isn't true. Amen. Time often makes things much worse. Wounds that are well untended, fester. Sister Rosalie's foot could not be closed up because of the infection on the inside. It has to heal from the inside out. Sister Perkins was in that coma for 14 days and her stomach, it cut into her stomach just a, like a big old pie wedge. And, and when the doctor came in, the, the surgeon one night, and I stayed with her for 14 days there in the ICU, and the doctor came in one night about 2 o'clock in the morning and I said, is there something wrong? It's so late. He said, no, I'm just making my rounds before I go home. Thank 
God and not a doctor. <laughs> they don't get a lot of sleep. I know they make a lot of money, but they don't get a lot of sleep. But the doctor said, did you ever see her wound? I said, no. Would you like to see it? I said, yes, I would. Wow. And he pulled that bandage back. He put a rubber glove that went clean up to his elbow, and he went down into her body. Oh, up to the elbow. And I mean, it was steep. And he shined the line. He said, that right there is her pelvic bone. That's where we're at. Right now. He said, I had to cut all of this muscle tissue and all of this flesh. I had to cut it back because it was full of infection. It's what was killing her. And he said, now she has to heal from the inside Back out. out. I said, how long will it take? He said, without help, probably a year. But he said, we have something called a wound vac. And they put that wound vac on her. It was like a little portable vacuum cleaner. And it was just constantly sucking. He said, it sucks all the, the dead flesh in there. He said it sucks out all the old bad blood. He said it pulls all of that out. He said it forces fresh blood to go in. He said because only the blood will heal this. Jesus. Hallelujah. And I got up and started shouting and he I guess he was ready to call somebody to come get me because I had lost my mind. And he said finally come over to God by the shoulder and he set me down on the recliner at the end of that room for me he said, are you okay? I said, it's what you just said. He said, what did I say? He said, the, the blood is what's going to heal that. Come to tell you tonight, it's the blood of Jesus that is able to heal you. Your vehicle. 
That just blessed me so much. Well, Sunday it broke, wouldn't start. And the lady told me they were the, the starter. Suzanne and I sat there for two hours waiting for the tow to get there. Well, when I went to drop it off, the man called and I said, I dread this call. He said, well, it's not your starter, it's not your alternator, just your battery, $30. Praise I said, God. thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking on the shore and I'm on your own and you're ready and that's just some money. Yes. Especially on the top of the believers. Oh <laughs> I rejoice with it. I really did. Yeah, we was sitting okay. in town. I said, what are you over there shouting about? I said, this is the biggest vehicle. I said, it was just a battery. And I said, the battery was under water and it didn't hardly cost or anything. Yeah. That's the kind of God. I consent to the law that it is good. 
laid in the register. I said, would you hold it just a minute? I went to the back and I found the manager. I said, told him what happened. He said, man, don't worry about it. Kids do it all the time. I said, no, today is candy. Next week it might be money. I said, in his teen years it might be a car. Or it might, might break into somebody's house. What do you want me to do? I said, I'm going back to the front. And when I see you coming, I'm going to put him down. And I want you to walk up to him. And I want you to eat him up a lot. <laughs> he turned around and wanted me to pick him up. I said, oh, no, buddy. You face him. I give him a dollar bill. And he quickly stuck that dollar bill out. <laughs> that big guy said, I'm going to tell you something, boy. You don't come in my store and steal candy. I ever catch you stealing candy again, I'm going to call the police and they're going to come get you and take you to jail. You'll never see your mom and daddy again and he's just a boo. Right. <laughs> give me that dollar bill. <laughs> he took that dollar bill from him I picked him up and he was just a trigger. Some of you might be saying, boy, you're a terrible daddy. No, I'm not. I want him to learn right from wrong. When we go to the store with Mr. Russell, he wouldn't even take Mr. Russell's candy. <laughs> he'd come and he'd want some money. I'd give him money. I, I wanted him to learn. He had to pay Amen. for what he was getting. Amen. It is a sin problem, even at a two-year-old. That's right. Yeah. The Bible has a word for this tendency toward self-defeating behavior. And that word is called sin. My sinful nature gets me in all kinds of problems. And so does yours. I have people call me when I go and get to talking to them. Their problem that they have in their home was self-induced. Self-inflicted. We bring 90% of our problems upon ourselves. Behind all of those problems is this sinful attitude. That's the truth. I want to decide. People said, I'm going to be like God. I want to decide what's right and wrong. I want to call the shots and make my own rules. I want to put myself at the center of the universe, be my own ball, live like the way I want to do it. If it feels good, then I want to do it. I don't want anyone telling me what to do with my life or how I should act. That's what you call playing God. My Jesus. What I'm really saying is people want to control. And a young man just a couple weeks ago from this community said he was talking to him about having a relationship with God. And he said, I chose the way I want to live. Most people do that. Most people like making all those decisions and calling the shots. You see, control is a real issue. We try to control our image. We want to control what other people think of us. We don't want them to know who we are really like. It tickles me when a young boy comes to see a young girl dating. He puts his best foot forward. <laughs> Always. He's all cleaned up. I helped with the wedding last Saturday. My great nephew got married. And I was talking to his in-laws. They said, he's just the sweetest little thing. <laughs> We're so glad he's our son. And my nephew was standing right behind me. He said, get him two or three years and you might want to change your mind. Because <laughs> mom and daddy know what he's like. Uh -huh. But when he's around them, yes ma'am and no ma'am and yes sir. And he was always dressed out so we can. And I laughed when he said that. My nephew said that. And, and the guy said, well I'm no dummy. I know. And he said, our daughter is the same way. <laughs> All y'all see is Elisa smiling. Elisa kind and gentle. But she didn't get her way sometimes. We saw the other side. Uh -huh. And I look at him. I say, that's her nature. 
her fleshly nature yeah. is coming out. He said, oh, I know that, Brother Perkins. I understand that. He said, and he started to say, she has a lot of growing. And he looked back and he said, no, I will say we all have a lot of growing. Amen. That's right. He said, the closer we draw to God, the better we'll get. We try to control other people. You ain't lying. Parents try to control kids and kids try to control parents. Wives try to control their husbands. Yep. And husbands try to control their wives. Uh -huh. Friends try to control their friends. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Are there office politics in their office? That's right. Do countries try to control other countries? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Time and time again. We use lots of tools to attempt to manipulate each other. Come on. Sometimes we use guilt. Yeah, that's a big yeah. guilt trip. Put a guilt trip on and they, they kind of submit. Sometimes we use fear. My daddy used to tell me, I brought you into the world and I can take you out. <laughs> My mom said, I had a part in that. Fear and intimidation. Said, but I am the head of the house. I want him to understand there's only room for one more than the pastor. Yeah. He said, and I did. Yeah. <laughs> he used fear, and I promise you it worked. <laughs> My dad said something, and he did this. That was it. We submitted. Yeah. Because we knew the next step was the belt. Yeah. <laughs> but there's not a lot of that today. No. They took it out of our schools. They took prayer out of our schools. And we're trying to recover. Sometimes ladies use the silent truth. The cold show. It don't work anymore, Sister Bula.
But I asked him, does your ankle hurt? I said, all the time. Just more and other times than when the Have you ever thought of how much time you spend running from pain? <laughs> when you can't take it anymore, they go hop in the, the pain. 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 How much time you spend trying to avoid it? Deny it, escape it, reduce it, postpone it, tell it faster. People try to postpone pain, pain in different ways. We try to postpone our pain by eating. Yeah. 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 Now, let's just be honest. Yeah. Let's keep it real. I eat all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we try to postpone pain by not eating. Yep. Some people try to postpone pain by getting drunk, <laughs> by doing drugs, <laughs> getting in and out of relationships, or you develop some kind of compulsive habit. To try to control your pain. Right. Or you become abusive, angry, critical, judgmental, depressed uh -huh. to try to hide your pain. Ain't that a fact? There's many ways we try to control our pain. Yes, sir. Fear. Yeah. That's a big that's a really big anybody ever had fear? Ooh. Oh my god. All the time. I read it again today. Mark Twain said 97. I thought it was 99. He said it was 97% of what we fear never happens. Never even happens. Never even happens. Brother Perkins, I was, a, I was a teenager. And my mom and dad had gone to awaken New Iberia. And you know how they have the cesspool? They call them the septic yeah. tank. Yeah. 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 My grandmother was living with us. And we had a phone, and I heard something jumping, I thought, on this thing. So I called my mom and my dad at the funeral home, and nobody answered. They couldn't find me. <laughs> at that time, they didn't have cell phones. I called somebody else. Uh -huh. I said, y'all go and tell my mom and my daddy they have a bath in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> and my daddy came home with, uh, they had so many people following him. <laughs> never found the bed. I was so scared. I know. Oh, I was, yeah. We were seven children. We were all in one bed under the cover. <laughs> and it was, it was summertime. You know, they made these old, these heavy, heavy quilts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought I was going to die. Oh. <laughs> Fear. 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 They never found the bed. Never found the bed. <laughs> My sister that lives in Texas, she's 83. She called me Friday and wished me happy birthday. She never misses. I said, How are you doing, sis? She said, I ain't slept all night long. I walked the floors. I said, What was it? Was your legs hurting? No worry. I said, What was you worrying about? That my house ain't fixed. <laughs> First thing I thought of, well, here goes my guilt trip. <laughs> and then she said, I just walked the floors and prayed God if He just lived close to me, my house would be finished. I said, When you finally daylight come, I said, Did anything change on your house? Busted with no, it's still all messed up. I said, You also could not sleep or <laughs> for something you can't change. That's right. I said, Did you ever hear the serenity prayer? I said, You pray over things that you can't change. Just pray about it. That's what I did. I walked the floor all night. I said, and your house is still not fixed. The inside is fixed. It's the outside. Her house sits about six inches off the ground. Whoa. <laughs> Somebody came and started this week, jacked it up, going to raise it up. I told her, I said, put it about four foot in there. Yeah. Oh, I'm 83. I'd never get in my house. I said, well, you put it four foot above the ground and then bring two 
who put a derby in and put it under the house. Yeah. I said, then you're only two foot off the ground. <laughs> Next time it rains, you won't call me and tell me, it's raining around here, so flood my house. I said, if it does this bad, don't call me. I said, because I won't answer. My nephew called yesterday and he said, they're jacking around. So I said, she's going to ride three or four foot there. <laughs> We're stubborn sometimes. Amen. God's trying to show us a pathway to walk in. God's showing us, His Word tells us what, what He likes and what He doesn't like. Right. And some of us need to be there. Genesis 3 and 10, Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. Why was he afraid? Because they had sinned. Disobedience. Told that precious lady in line at Walmart today, I said, you just repent, get filled with the Holy Ghost, baptize in his name, and live holy and righteous. You don't have to worry about what's going on in the world. Amen. You can go to sleep. I said, either way it goes, we win. Amen. Whether now or the rapture. She said, well, I'm trying to live right. She reached her first pull out of school. She said, I can't smoke in here. She said, I'm going to smoke when I'm worried. <laughs> so she was sitting there talking, and her husband walked up. He said, I saw you driving with that cigarette guy. Well, I'm worried. He said, your worry is self-induced. When no Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. And God said, why were you afraid? Notice what the end of verse 10 says, because I was naked. So I hid myself. And God said, who told you you were naked? He said, you made another tree that I commanded you not eat of. Anybody ever been frustrated? Yes, oh, God, God, yes. A lot of times we live in frustration. Amen. Aggravation. Have you ever seen the carnival game played with a mallet? You slam the thing down and another pops up and hits the bell? Yeah. That's life. Amen. That's life. We wag down one compulsion and another one pops up. That's right. To replace it. We went way down one convict and another one pops up. Uh -huh. My God. It's so frustrating. Yes. Because you can't get them all knocked down at the same time. The frustration you feel is a symptom of a deeper problem that we have. And it's a problem we've not dealt with. And when you try to control it, the things, it just simply don't work. Even parents try to control their children. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Mrs. Burke says she don't really like, she wants me to go with her to Walmart, but she don't really like me to follow her around. <laughs> Oh, no, I touched it again or I said it again. 
will be in trouble. Here comes Paul. Romans 7 and 21, and I'm closing. He says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. That's the God's honest truth, Pastor. Psalms 32 and 3 says, When I keep silence, my bones wax old through my roaring all the day long. My God. We have got to understand. God wants us to recover what the devil's taken from us. That's true. But in order for us to recover it, yep. we've got to be obedient right. okay. to his word. Amen. Another thing is fatigue. It's a thing, you know, you get tired of playing God. We try to hide our pain by keeping busy because we don't like the way we feel when we slow down. Out that way. Savior asked me today, why don't you ever just come in and sit down a while? <laughs> <laughs> I said, Sister Abair, who's going to cut the grass? <laughs> said, Sister Abair, who's going to fix the flat tires? <laughs> well, you need to just come in and sit down. But as long as I'm moving and my blood is warm, I really feel good. Amen. That old ankle that's it's all messed up. As long as I'm moving, it feels good. Uh -huh. But I can sit out on that bench right there for five minutes, and when I get up, I feel like I'm three years old. I get up, and I'm still. Yeah. I see John shaking his head. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, you got armor just like I did. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh -huh. We don't like the way we feel when we slow down. So we run from pain by constantly being on the go with the world. That's right. Ask yourself, what is it that I'm really running from? That's just a real good question we need to ask ourselves sometimes. And when God reveals it to us, we need to understand it was so that we can change it. Amen. Proverbs 28-13 says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Basically, there's two things every human being needs to learn. Number one, there is a God. Yes, there is. And number two, you're not him. We're not Jesus. We're not Jesus. Amen. We're not God. No. I don't even want God's responsibilities. No. He's got too many. I really don't. Because I am not God trying to control people, situations, and myself completely wears us out. It's all yours. God did not create me to be general manager no, of the universe. No. That position is already filled. Amen. That's God's position. Throughout life, we all learn various coping systems that seem to work for a time when we need to get attention or walk out pain. But as the years progress, these same ideas confuse and cloud our views of what the truth is. Yes, sir. Our perception of ourselves and our expectations of those around us. The longer we hold on to them, the more unrealistic and distorted they become, eventually grows into denial. All right. Jeremiah 6 and 14 says, They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Oh, God. It's one of the things Brother Baxter texted me today. He said, The Bible says they'll cry, Peace, peace. Then come a sudden destruction. He reminded me that the last 30 or 40 years, maybe even longer than that, every president has tried to get a peace accord That's right. to right. Right. Yeah. with the Middle East. Right. They met at 
Camp David, and they, they met in the White House, and, and they met overseas, and they have never yet gotten one. But Brother Sebastian said, Remember, Brother Perkins, soon and very soon they're going to come up with one because it is the divine will of God. Yes. He said, and When they come up with that peace agreement and they get them to sign off on it, That's it. that new temple will be built. That's it. And he said, that When it is the Antichrist will walk in and declare himself as Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Yep. Step to those steps. He said, that is how close we are yep. to the coming of the Lord. We're there. Second Peter 2 and 19 says, while they promised them liberty, they themselves were the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. Unfortunately, it is human nature that we never change until our pain becomes greater than the fear of change. It's so unbearable. We don't change when we see the light. We change when we feel the heat. Yeah. And things start falling apart. Yeah. God whispers to us in our pleasure, but He shouts to us in our pain. Yes, sir. Paul said it is high time yes. to awake out of our slumber. Yes. yes. It's time to wake up. I had a backslider tell me that the other day. He said, you know, Brother Burgess, he said, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I've been hearing God was coming for a long time. He said, he hadn't come yet. I said, well, we are one day closer to it happening. Any second to that. And I told that backslider, I said, Jesus said, the only way we're going up is if the Spirit had raised him from the grave. He could abide in us. He said, if that same Spirit that raised me from the dead abide in you, it will quicken your mortal body. And you shall be called up. And so shall we know that you the Lord. Pain is God's megaphone. It's a warning line on the dashboard of life. Please let it motivate you to get a wake up call and face issues. God is coming back. Hello? We're going to stop right there. I'm already over on your time. God is wanting us to recover. Jesus. Talk to the other saint. This is past week. She looked at me and she said, Preacher, I wish I had the joy of the night I got the Holy Ghost. She said, Joy just overwhelmed me. And I've been living for God, I think she said, 61 years. She said, But I just don't have the joy that I once had. I said, You want to know why? So the devil is trying to wear out the saints. Right. The scripture says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes. 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 You ever heard of the old cliche? If you don't use it, you lose it. Right. <laughs> there was an 81 year old lady at rehab this morning. This is Avery right there. And she said, Oh, I'm just so tired and weak. She said, But when I get through with this rehab, I'm going to join me in a gym. And I'm going to get them to build a muscle back up in my legs. And she said, I'm going to get me some. Tall muscles in my arm, and she, she took her sweater off and held her arm up, and you know, it kind of sagged her skin. She said, I'm only 81. I said, well, you just go for it, mother. Go down and tone you up. There was some out there said, Are you ready? And she said, No, oh, not really. <laughs> I laugh when I sit there because every person they come to get says the same thing. Oh, I really. Why? Because they're 
they're using things that they have not used for a long time. And they, I think the word is atrophy. Yep, that's it. They begin to deteriorate because they're not used. Faith that Brother Hudson preached about it yeah. in the same way. You want your faith to grow? You just lose it. Release it. Well, what about praying all right gets well? That wasn't your no place that you ought to start with. The first one. Your place was to be the vessel that yes. God was over. Hallelujah. Just get your ball on. Go through the wall and tell people. They call me to tell you they got you over there in jail and you lost your mind. That's okay. I'll go get you out. I'll call you. I carry my oil every time I go to Walmart because I never go there unless somebody comes up. You think you can pray for me? And what they mean is, can you go back to your church? Yeah. Yeah. They leave my right name and stuff down. I look at the name and I say, Lord, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Boom, and some of you fill us. Good. <laughs> I didn't put it in right now. I said, right now is good as time as it is. I said, I promise you, Walmart knows me well enough. They won't throw me out. <laughs> That's right, yes. They know me well enough. I pray for people on those benches all the time. That's right. There's a lady there, her name is Joanne. And Joanne said, Well, I said, you got something at your little church. That's what she calls them bitches in the room. I said, You got something at your little church? I said, Yeah, but they won't pray. I don't pray for them. She said, Just get angry. That's right. Uh, Most of the time, it's the people that need God to help them that are embarrassed to be prayed for. And if they should tell me right up front, don't do it now, I don't. Some of them really, truly need help. Because they're going through life and it's full of troubles. It's full of troubles. Let's stand. Thank you so much, Sister Perkinson, to remind me of the adult choir practice, 7 o'clock. Thursday night. Can I say something? Yes, sir. Last night, we watched a message by Brother Jeff Horn. And it was called Chosen but Unqualified. Wow. And I suggest anybody that can look that message up, sit there and watch that.